everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, Wellington session where we'll be exploring when and why projects exceed expectations from a new lens, the human first experience. And before we do, let me introduce myself. I'm Elena Lara, the marketing manager at Wellington, and we had originally planned this webinar with Emma Ruthernat, our consultant director, but due to personal reasons, she is unable to join us today. But I'm joined by our special guest, Mark Vincent. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? You will indeed. I will indeed. Yes. So you have me, I'm afraid, this morning. So hopefully that's a, that's a good thing. Um, so um, my name is Mark Vincent. I've been involved in uh, change and transformation now for 25 years. Um, and uh, part of that has been with some very, very fast moving sectors, uh, organizations and whole sectors, in fact, um, more, most notably the music sector as it went through the early days of transforming from a physical to a digital business. So I've learned a lot about the human side of change as a result of that, um, and that's what we'll be uh, focusing on today. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, so let's start uh, with a short intro to Wellington before we get into today's topic. Uh, we are Wellington, and our promise to you is that by taking up our services, your project and portfolio management capabilities will be improved, and that is something we provide with a money-back guarantee, yes. And we have been around since 2001. And as you can see on the screen, we collected a few accreditation over the last 20 years. We have our headquarters in Windsor and offices in Ireland, Spain, and in India. And we work globally to support our customers, no matter where we are, where they are, sorry. And we, we do offer a variety of services that span consultancy, technology, and training. And the focus is again on helping our customers to improve their PPM capability from a variety of angles. And you can read more about us at wellington.co.uk. Uh, so you just please follow uh, that link and have a look through the website. And just before we move on to the topic and Mark takes control, here is a very quick look at some of the customers we've worked with over the last 20 or so years. And there are a large number of case studies available on our website. So if you want to read them, just follow that link and it will take you straight there. Mark, you are all up. I'm going to give you control now. Give me a second. Excellent. Um, this is here. So we can get this technology to work. That will be absolutely yes, I will do it. <laughs> so uh, we'll all yours, Mark. So I think uh, where's the screen sharing? Let's stop sharing my webcam. No, show screen. Now hopefully you can see yes. the same. So you can see a screen that says it's perfect now. You yeah. can see. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good. Okay. We're in, we're in business. So good morning, everyone. Uh, let me start with a little bit of a question. And if you are able to use the chat, feel free to do so. Um, I just want to check in with you that um, we're going to talk a little bit about the human side of change today. Um, before we do that, um, put, so put a one in the chat. If you believe that the ability to transform and adapt is critical to staying ahead. Just put a one in the chat. Just give me a bit of feedback here. Make sure we're uh, we're on topic. Yeah. So, okay, given that's the case, what does it often end up feeling like when you're running a business change and transformation? Well, maybe you have your milestone plan. You have the PMO in place. You have the governance. All the pieces, all the processes are in place for this to be a great transformation. And yet you're a few months in and you're in one of those meetings where the conversation just seems to be going round in circles. People are not really agreeing on who's going to take responsibility for doing something. Arguing whether this should be sales or marketing. Or giving excuses as to why they haven't completed what they said they would at the last meeting. And the thing is, this isn't the first time this has happened. This has gone on for many weeks now. And what you're seeing is more and more reasons why things haven't been done, 
and maybe even a bit of a bit too much time spent on whether the status report should be green, amber, or red. Meanwhile, all you can see is your milestones are starting to slip, and those difficult conversations with your bosses are looming. Or potentially, one of the key people in the organization, those people who can make big decisions, haven't taken those decisions. They haven't had the difficult conversations that they promised to have. The conversations, you know, the ones that are going to free up resources. The conversations maybe with another executive that are going to maybe stop a pet project of theirs in order to free up resources and focus on this project or program. Maybe the conversation that is going to change the nature of the organization such that this new project or program makes more sense, that the new processes will make more sense. But those conversations haven't happened, and so therefore you're in a position where you're having to kind of work around them. It's adding more time to your work schedule, which is already getting busy. And as a consequence of all of that, you're the ones stuck in meetings trying to piece everything together to try and rescue something from all of this so that you can make some kind of progress. So you're working longer hours, back-to-back -back meetings, and all you can see is the issues continuing to pop up and you're beginning to play whack-a-mole. So more issues are coming up than are getting solved. Or maybe you've, you've, you're part way in. Maybe you've actually implemented something. You're at the end of phase one and you've implemented something, but you're not really getting the adoption that you're looking for. New technology, new ways of working, new business processes aren't truly being adopted. New behaviors maybe in a culture change. People are reverting back to old ways. So you're in this kind of half in situation. Any of that sounding familiar so far? Yeah? It's very common. So how could it be? Imagine how it can be. So visualize you're at the end of the second quarter and you've not only hit your milestones, you're actually ahead of the game. And as a consequence of that, you can start getting a little bit bolder about where to go next. You're making even more progress than you'd expected. Imagine everybody involved in the change truly cooperating, enjoying the process, collaborating well. It's fun, it's energizing. They're valuing each other's differences, building on each other's ideas, inspiring each other. And imagine as, as a consequence of that, you're able to focus your attention on where you can add the most value, supporting people through the change process. And really putting your energies into the things that you truly believe are where your talents lie. And picture a time when everybody at the end of the process, those people who, who you're delivering into, are already reimagining how they can do their job better, how they can serve customers better, how they can interact with each other better, even do the financials better if that's their thing. Yeah? Give better information to their customers within the organization. They're already having those conversations, and as the new technology or new ways of working come, they're actually already thinking about how they can adapt them, how they can get proactive. Sound good? So of course the question is, how do you get from here, where it's difficult, to here, which we've just been talking about? Well, I believe the answer lies in putting people truly at the heart of change. What do I mean by that? Well, it sounds obvious, right? Because we, we, we talk about this, we talk about hearts and minds, and that this is the problem. We talk about it, but most change leaders, most organizations don't go anywhere near deep enough on this topic. So as a consequence of that, what happens is projects or programs end up in this kind of half in state. Something may get delivered, some new technology may get delivered, but it's not truly adopted in a sense that people are really re-engineering and rethinking how their roles are gonna be. And so as a, as, as a result of that, what you end up with is a, is a situation which um, which you end up essentially with, with the project not really achieving everything that was set out to. 
And this is actually a common problem. It's a common problem, more common than you'd think. Now, we've been talking for many years about the McKinsey 70% uh, failure rate, as people call it. And I can sense eyes rolling as I say it. So, um, of course, the thing is, they don't actually fail. 70% of projects or programs don't actually fail. A proportion of them do, as in they deliver no material value at all. Uh, and in some cases, according to McKinsey, go so bad, they threaten the existence of the entire company. So yes, some do go bad, but the vast majority fall in this kind of no man's land where they've delivered something, but nowhere near the kind of value that was hoped for and expected. So just to put some data behind that, and if my, uh, there you go, that works, there you go. Just to put some data behind that, the um, Oxford Business School, a, uh, somebody called Bent Flavio, you may have uh, read a book that's going around at the moment called How Big Things Get Done. And he points to some really interesting data that they've built up over 20 years around project and program performance. Now they've looked at all kinds of different programs, construction projects, such as, as really big ones as well, such as tunnel projects, channel tunnel, HS2, those kinds of things. But also in there are technology projects, big and small within organizations. And the graph that I'm showing you now is essentially their findings. I'm just going to point you to the on-time and on budget, or better, 8.5%. So in other words, doing things as we said we would, in terms of when we said we would, and for the amount of money we said we would, 8.5%. But what's really interesting is when you add in delivery of benefits as well, that number goes down to 0.5%. Now this currently is the most rigorous information we have uh, on the planet around project performance. So, you know, you could look at that and you say, well, it's, of course, a bit depressing, isn't it? It doesn't look great. I tend to come at it the other way. Because what that peaks in me is a sense of curiosity. So what is it that that 0.5% are doing that we could emulate, that we could model, that we could bring into our projects and programs? Because isn't that the answer, right? What is their secret source? because there are some things that do exist every single time in those projects. So why does it matter now? Why is now the thing? Right? So now is, what's happening is, as you may have noticed, the pace that's, or, or the, the things that are driving the need to change are accelerating rapidly. What used to be okay to take maybe a couple of years, wasn't that long ago, maybe five years ago, now, we're expecting things to be done in six months. That's driven by a number of factors, some of the recent global factors that we know about. But in addition, there's some underlying technologies that are really coming to the fore. I'll talk to you a little bit about what the internet did to the music industry. That's just one technology. But beyond that, what we have are things like blockchain. We have uh, driverless cars. We have, um, of course, the emergence of robotics and machine learning. And as we all know, you're looking at ChatGPT and what that potentially can do on its own to many different industries. When you start to combine all of these different technologies, it's hard to imagine a, a, a sector or industry that won't be affected in some way. So, I'm gonna ask you a question. What, which of these four, so at the top left, we've got Sydney Opera House. Top right, we have Heathrow Terminal 5. Bottom left, we have the Empire State Building. And bottom right, we have the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. So my question to you is, and we'll come back to it later as a quiz, which one of those is the odd one out? So, Another question I'm going to ask you to reflect on as I talk to the next bit is where does, if you're doing a big change, a big transformation in your business involving hundreds, maybe even thousands of people, where does change, where does that change really come from? Where does it come from? 
So I want you to come back with me in time to February 2012. And I'm in, fortunate enough, I'm in Manhattan in New York. It's actually quite a bright, clear day. Uh, and I'm in that building that you can see on the right there. And as you can see from the images on the left, it's quite a funky building. It's, it's a, as you'd expect from a music company, even back then, before everybody had breakout rooms and, and, and interesting stuff. They were always fairly high tech and, and it was a fun, interesting place to be. Except I'm not in one of those rooms. I'm in the basement. And the basement is one of those rooms that they put all of the project people to keep them out of the way. It's a dark, dingy, gray space. Slightly stale smell from the night before, people working late into the night. And surrounding me are the debris from that sort of thing. You've got pizza boxes, coffee cups, really drab. So as I'm sitting there, I can hear the traffic outside. You know when that situation, when it starts to, the, you, it's almost like you're shrinking into a little thought bubble and the, the sound just disappears. And I'm reflecting on the meeting that I've had recently and the one that's about to come. I can feel my throat starting to, to a lump starting to form in my throat, my mouth's getting dry. And in she walks, Miranda. Asian New Yorker, mid forties, brown, dark hair, real power dresser. So I think devil wears Prada and you're along the right lines. So she creeps, walks slowly and emphatically towards the desk where I'm sitting. And she leans across, looks me in the eye and says, Mark, I'm not happy with what I'm hearing from my team. And by the way, I'm not gonna do a New York accent. Don't do accents. Mark, I'm not happy with what I'm hearing from my team. She's glaring at me. And I'm feeling a combination of frustration mixed with a little bit of fear, to be honest, because at the time I'm an independent consultant and of course I could get fired, right? But I am also really frustrated. Miranda, for goodness sake, we've been here so many times. We're only two weeks from go live. If we are on the path you're suggesting, it's going to add at least another six months of customizations. We're breaking away from a proven model that we've known for many years, that we've, we've been working on for many years. And you won't achieve the benefits you're looking for. So putting that into context, in the music industry at that time, CD sales, which is what this was all about, were dropping like a stone. It was at a time when the internet was really take, coming of its age. They were dropping like a stone. And in the US, this was especially so. So this project was about improving efficiency in this area. And yet here we were, two weeks before go live. And there she is, pulling the plug. Mark, I'm not comfortable. And in the end, it's my reputation on the line. It's my call and I'm calling it. You'll make those customizations. So if you have had a situation where you're trying to get a point across or, or you can't understand why the other person just can't see what seems to be so obvious, in this case, the numbers were absolutely clear. She had the same information as I did. In fact, they were the ones who wanted to, to get more efficient, to get more consolidated. But when it really came to it. And so as a consequence of that, what we ended up with was heavily customizing what was a proven, well-proven operating model and systems. And this took many months. It actually took nine months. And, as a, and what we found, and I was working with my colleague at the time, Martin, he was a rugby player, and he said to me, it felt often like he was in a constant rugby scrum, back and forth. Because of course, what happened then is we found all kinds of new issues, all kinds of things that we couldn't even have imagined because we were going off piste. We were essentially creating a whole new way of working. And that way of working, of course, was very similar to the one they already had, because that's what they were 
trying to get to. Even the uh, the way the reports and the macros came out had to be exactly the same as what they had today. We did get it over the line eventually, but of course, as what we found is people were moaning about it, they weren't happy about it, the benefits weren't really there. Not what you'd call a success, albeit it was ticked off as done. So fast forward a few months, it's now mid 2013, June 2013. And I'm with a with an old mate of mine, Kevin, we're in Kensington. Kevin's a change guy who's been around for many, many years, done loads of big, big changes. So he's a really good mentor and advisor to me. Um, and we're having a coffee, it's a beautiful day in Kensington. We're sitting outside a coffee shop, traffic's going past. And he looks at me and he's, he looks a little bit like, um, he's very action oriented looking guy. He's sort of white shirt, rolled up to the sleeves, and real full of energy, fun guy. Looks a little bit like Daniel Craig, actually, thinking about it. Um, so he looks at me, he says, Mark, Mark, Mark I, well, I, I don't get, you know, I really don't understand what happened with this US project. You know, you, 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 you've, you've always done all right with building relationships, so why couldn't you do the same thing with these guys? I said, well, that was the point, Kevin. I could never really figure that out. There's always something going on that I couldn't quite get to. There was, they were very standoffish. They just wouldn't really engage. And I never really did, you know, never understood what it was. He said, well, Mark, Mark, you, you, you did say to me something about um, that, that, that um, they didn't, there wasn't really a, tr you know, there was a trust issues, that they were all very defensive in meetings. I don't know what, there was something about the way he said that that just hit me. Hit me really hard. It was something that I'd missed, or at least not, you know when you, you're aware of something but you don't, you don't really let it in, you, you just dismiss it, right? And I had that moment when I was sitting there where it almost felt like the clouds had parted and there was absolute clarity. Have you ever had a moment like that in life where you just, you just think, well, oh, why didn't I see this before, right? Why didn't I see this before? And what it was is that this particular group of people in this situation were incredibly self-protective. They were, they were working inside a culture that would typically um, could fire people within a day. You know, people could just literally be told to leave and that would be the end of it. Now, in the US, quite often, um, there's a lot of their life is tied around their job. So, for example, healthcare is linked to employment. Often, private education is linked to employment. So, losing your job there, A, is very easy, and B, is highly consequential. And a lot of people also are living up to their means, as is probably the case today. And so, nobody wanted to get fired. And so, what that was driving was this behavior of protectionism where nobody would trust each other. So why would they have trusted me as an external consultant coming in from Europe with a European model for change? And this was the point, I didn't know that. I didn't understand what they were afraid of. And as a consequence, and, and they weren't showing up in meetings being transparent about what they were afraid of. They were pretending everything was okay which is why I didn't see it. It appeared that things were okay, but I had a sense that, it wasn't, that everything wasn't, but I never really knew, I never really truly understood. And so it sort of took me to a different place. And I made a decision that day that when you're dealing with any change situation, you've got to go way, way, way deeper with people than most leaders, most organizations actually do and understand what that change looks like through the eyes of those people whose engagement really is critical to success. Thinking about all those people at the other end of the systems and processes and changes that you're putting through, they're the ones who are gonna make it successful. So it's really vital to understand what it looks like coming back the other way. What are they afraid of? What's going on in their life that may be a problem? How are they seeing the change that's unique? And so that was essentially the, the start of where my company went with our uh, tools and, and, and approaches. 
Um, I'll share a little bit about that today. Um, we've been developing, we've developed something called the, uh, the High Impact Changemaker System, which really puts a framework around this to give some guidance as to how to do that, what sort of things typically stop people engaging. And I'll share a few uh, tips around that uh, today, if that's okay with you. Um, are we okay so far, by the way? I'm just going to check in. I, I don't you know if I can actually see the chat. I don't know, um, Elena, if you can see anything. Or, uh, yeah, I can see the chat, and there is no question now. They're but... all okay at the moment. Okay, cool. That's all right. I think I can see a blank chat. So good. No okay, so hopefully I'm left. I've lost anyone yet. Um, so. We've been, as I say, uh, building up this uh, gradually. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll just take a few minutes to share with you, if that's okay, some of the things that you could do practically or think about practically that will help with that engagement um, and, and to really push beyond what most organizations and to get to that 0.5%, which reminds me, I'm going to come back to, before I do that, the question. Uh, that I asked at the beginning. Two questions, actually. The first one is, where does change really come from? And hopefully you'll get where I was going with this in terms of the story and what I've learned from this, which is that ultimately, if you've got 100 people, 1,000 people, or tens of thousands of people, ultimately the transformation in real terms is coming from inside each and every one of them. They are going on their own journey, making their own decisions, about engagement, about the extent to which they will be brave and embrace the change. I'm going to come back now to um, this image and these four. So top right, Sydney Opera House, Terminal 5, uh, bottom left, uh, sorry, bottom left is uh, um, Empire State and then bottom right is Guggenheim. Any ideas? Which one is the odd one out? No? Okay. Nobody brave enough? Let me tell you. The odd one out is Sydney Opera House. And why is that? It's because Sydney Opera House is the only one that didn't fall into the 0.5%. The other three came in on time, on budget, and delivered huge benefits. Sydney Opera House. Uh, on the other hand, was 14 times over budget, it was late, and the uh, architect had to leave Australia in shame. He never built another building in his life, which I think is a real shame. I mean, look at it. The other thing is, it's completely unsuited to opera. So what have the other three got in common? Well, what they all reported was this sense of everyone really, truly feeling that they're in it together, that they were prepared to put aside all of their differences and really get on board and make that change happen. So essentially what we're looking at here and what High Impact Changemaker is all about is creating those conditions to make that more likely in any change situation and in any organization. So let me just quickly talk you through. How are we doing for time, Elena? Are we good? Um, so we're on the half past at the moment. Yeah, we're we? good. We're good. No yeah. worries. So just I'll just rattle through this very quickly. Um, I do run a regular event. Um, I'll share with my LinkedIn profile in a minute. So if there's anything, if you want to go deeper, you want to know more information, just message me on LinkedIn when I share my profile. Um, and or uh, we've got the next event on the 7th of July. So if you want to join that, feel free to, to, to do that. Um, so... The first thing that, um, the first pillar skill, if you like, so we're going to talk about five key pillar skills um, that help to create the conditions that make change happen faster and easier. Um, we've got a very easy tool as well that you can use if you, if you want to get there faster. Um, so the first of these five pillar skills, or key things to look out for, all based on the experiences I, my team have had, and also the, all the latest research on behavioral science points to this as well as well as the other models that we're all familiar with, such as ADCAR, COTA. But essentially, I've distilled this down to, to make it easier. Five pillar skills. So the first pillar skill is creating the energy for change. And what does that mean? Well, looking at the, the symptoms I talked about earlier, most organizations don't go anywhere near far enough in giving people a real reason to motivate, to, to go forward. And I'm talking about here is, is that sort of 
the, the, the idea that people are going to literally run to get this change done. They, they really want it to happen. There's an energy to make it happen. So what often happens is we have a few PowerPoint slides and some presentations, maybe some town halls. And it's sort of an expectation that people will just go with it and they're happy with it. And what generally happens as a consequence of that is there's a sort of, sounds good, it's okay. People get it rationally, but they're not really emotionally attached. And so where that leads is that they just end up getting distracted, prioritizing other things, and don't do the things that need to happen to collectively move the change forward. So maybe you'll notice that if you, if you look out for it, you'll see that um, the people just aren't showing up for meetings when they said they would, or you know they've had something more important get in the way, uh, issues aren't getting resolved, tasks aren't getting done as fast as you'd like. So when you see that in your organization, look out for it, yeah? Understand, try and understand for yourself, what is it that's stopping them? Is it that they're really not feeling it enough? They're not seeing the importance of it strongly enough to get them on board. So what, what we've done with our clients and what we're working on with our clients is to create a system around that, right? So what are the things you could do to create that energy? Yeah. So we have a system called Spark, which is really all about firing people up. It's, it's putting all of the factors in place that will most likely create the right conditions for people to get on board. Things like compelling vision, things like the urgency for change. You know, what are the macroeconomic factors? So, um, so as I said, really important. Focus in on making sure that people truly feel emotional connection to that change. So the next one, <clears throat> um, once we assume we have some motivation and some forward motion, if you like, and some energy and change, the next one, of course, is to not make it too difficult. Because another common problem is that organizations uh, have, have got things in place that are essentially working against that change. Yeah? Things like you know, misaligned incentives or um, you know, the way the organization works, trying to get things approved and signed off and everything else. Right? Things just getting in the way. Time is a big one, right? People not feeling they have enough time. Uh, too many projects or programs going on at the same time which means that people are, are struggling to actually make the time to get the change done. So we're just making it hard for people. The analogy I often use is, that is um, if you think about uh, you're trying to do dry January, if any of you have done dry January, what's the first thing that happens? Well, you get invited to a cocktail party, don't you, with drinks. So it's things that are going to frustrate your ability to deliver on the thing that you said you were going to do. This happens all the time in organizations. So be on the lookout. What are the things getting in the way? Yeah, what are the things that are likely to slow people down? So we use something called the friction formula, which is, a, again, another system to identify the common sources of, of friction within organizations, right? So you can start to uh, remove them, start to get them out of the way. Yeah? Maybe not all of them straight away, but over time, you can really focus attention on those things that will just help to make the change go through, some, through more smoothly. Okay, so the next one, momentum is absolutely critical. It's all very well saying you've got a great goal, you've got um, you know, a, a great vision that everybody buys into. And even if you've swept away a lot of the, 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 um, the, the friction uh, aspects, what will happen if you're not careful is that people won't understand what it is they need to do. So it'll feel too distant and too far away. So we've got to make this really close and immediate. So what often happens, as I say, is that, that people um, are um, yeah, just feeling that they don't know how this thing is going to get done. They get disillusioned and it ends up feeling like the same, uh, uh, same as last time. We said we were going to do it, didn't really get there. So the drive system really is about breaking down what are the key components. So things like being able to see where you are on the journey, seeing the progress, reflecting back at what's not working. Easy, quick wins, right? What are the easy steps? What are the quick wins you can go after that will really motivate people to see that things are actually going in the direction that you'd like? So the next one is sustaining the change. It's one thing landing it, especially where new technology is involved. It's quite another thing allowing it to go deep enough that it really embeds, really sticks. You know, we've talked a lot post-COVID about the new normal, right? This is essentially what we're trying to create here. And in many uh, change scenarios, nowhere near enough attention is being paid to that. 
we may have all heard about the drop and run scenario, what happens when new technologies um, delivered. Many of you heard of that. Many of you come across that, right? And what happens is people start to revert back. You may have noticed that, right? They start doing their old behaviors, start creeping back in. Uh, and that can get really dangerous in terms of quality of data and consequential loss. Um, I've seen a situation where uh, one client understated massively their revenues because uh, essentially, uh, sorry, overstated their revenues because they were double counting um, as a result of poor quality data because systems and processes hadn't bedded in properly. People made mistakes. So it's really important to pay attention to creating the conditions and allowing people uh, the support and all the other um, aspects to, to, to really drive that change and make it a new normal. And that's where the Make It Stick Sustainer is really about creating, understanding those conditions and then putting those things in place. And the last, but by no means least, in all of this is continually keep your eye on the ball. What, what's actually happening in the change? What's happening, happening around the change? I mean, look what happened in March 2020, for example, when all of a sudden COVID hit and all these projects and programs were steaming ahead. Relevance changes. We have the global economic scenario uh, right now, cost of living. And so that will be inwardly affecting people's reactions. Okay, so as change leaders, it's really important to continually monitor what's going on, both externally to the change in terms of its overall relevance and internally to the change in terms of the people and their feelings towards it. So the Stay Alert system is really about understanding and measuring the right things, because it's very easy to measure the wrong things and therefore lead yourself down a wrong path as a consequence. So it's really picking out and constantly revisiting what are the right things to measure that will help stay on path. And I talked a little bit earlier and the whole theme of this really is about the people. Um, so we've introduced something which I'm more than happy to share with you separately called Change Journey Navigator, which helps you to fast track those elements I've just talked about. So very quick measurement in your organization about how you can uh, see how people are feeling from all of those different perspectives. What are the, what are the barriers getting in the way? How are they, how, how energized are they? Do they understand the journey? Yeah, so all this kind of stuff. So you can get there really fast. And that's what that's all about. So I'm going to um, pause there briefly. Um, and I think, uh, Elena, um, did we want to open up for questions? I mean, I can just very quickly talk a little bit about um, what Change Journey Navigator is about, and um, and obviously put my LinkedIn profile up. How would you wanna? Yes, uh, that's perfect. Um, I mean, people feel feel free to pop up questions to Mark. Um, we will review them as soon as they come up, and he will be answering them. If you want to, uh, if you want, I'm gonna share the results of the poll that we did. Uh, yeah, perfect. We, we can wait. talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here it is. Can you see it? Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, so let me let me be presenter. This is one of the things that like we need to be changing. Oh, hang on. Uh, no, it does say showing polls. Oh, is no. it showing? Okay. So uh, it says what are the, your key challenges? And we have eighty percent of people responding. We are too optimistic about plans. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Mark, about the results? Yeah, so optimistic about plans. Um, that's obvious, often true. Um, that being said, what I've noticed is, um, you know, pointing back to the to the uh, the project where it didn't go so well. Immediately after that, we had one that um, that basically a, 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 an implementation, a completely new business model, a new customer service, new um, cash collection, which we had to do. Uh, we previously with the fastest we'd ever done it uh, for a smaller country was nine months mm -hmm. and the bigger ones were typically nearer 12. It's a big big implementation and we had to do this to the UK company at this time in this organization was the was the it's one of the biggest markets for that organization so they had a lot of power and it was a lot of um, yeah a lot of risk let's say. Um, now for external reasons that were beyond any of our control it made a lot of sense to get this done in five months. We'd never done it in less than 12. 
So there yeah. was an optimistic plan right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got it done in five. We got it done in five with almost no issues, at least no major ones. We got it done in five with a high energy team that absolutely really enjoyed being part of that process. Yeah. This is the thing. So are we talking about optimistic plans? Or is it the way that people are showing up and the way that people are, um, you know, the, the extent to which they're truly committed and not distracted by the gazillion other projects or programs that same organization is trying to run at the same time? In this particular case, everybody from the executives to the, to the people on the front line were truly committed to making this happen. We achieved what was normally a year in five months. I'll also point to something else that we're all more familiar with, which is vaccine rollout. Yeah, we've seen from COVID. Now, what's typically happened, if you talk to AstraZeneca, what would normally take 12 years, they got done in one. Yeah. So yeah. I would question the fact that the timelines are optimistic. Yes, often they are. Okay. Terminal 5, which I pointed out earlier, that was done in, in about half the time it would normally take to do the equivalent. They set a deadline. They achieved it. So I would say it's actually more about getting the forces aligned to get people there, yeah, and to get people truly bought in, truly wanting this to happen. Any other thoughts on that or pushbacks? Feel free to challenge me on that. Thank you, Mark. There is no questions in the in the panel. Um, so in in I think we we are over the the time already so um i think so i'm going to put my details here if anything that i've said resonates uh, with any of you uh, then please do uh, do give me a call um and what i've what i've noticed as i as i talked about earlier is that with the subsequent changes after the one um where i sort of learned my hard lesson in new york um i have you know obviously been working with clients and practicing myself is that when you focus on this kind of thing, what happens as a change leader is your job starts to get easier. Other people are solving the issues for you. Other people are um, finding more innovative ways to deliver the value of what you were trying to get done. And that, as a consequence of that, your plate as a change leader becomes less, right? It becomes easier. The weight comes off your shoulders and spreads across the community. And you get there quicker. And you know what? It's more fun. It's more fun as well because they love it, right? And, and I had people coming to me even two or three years later saying, oh, that, that was such a great project. Really, really enjoyed it, being part of it. Um, one of the best, yeah? And that's what you're trying to achieve. If you're doing a great job in change is that you really want to get to that place, right? It should be fun. It should be energizing. And if you can create those conditions, I'll tell you now, you can achieve almost anything. So please do connect with me on LinkedIn if you like the sound of that. Um, message me with any questions, of course. Um, more than happy to go deeper on any of the topics uh, if you resonate with any of that. Um, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to see you again. Thank you, Mark. It was very, very interesting, and thank you so much for sharing your experience. And we will follow up um, with uh, all the attendees, and we will be sharing this video on the Wellington website in also our social media. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Thank you all. Cheers. Cheers.